The following program contains disturbing subject matter and images. Viewer discretion is advised. They're an army of outlaws. There are between 2,500 and 4,000 Hells Angels in the world right now. Highly organized. They are the mafia on wheels. And extremely violent. They may firebomb, they sniper with high-powered rifles. But who are the Hells Angels? They are a nasty, vicious, international crime syndicate. How dangerous are they? They have a thousand men behind them that will do anything they can for each other, including kill somebody. And is their reputation as freewheeling rebels simply a smokescreen for a more secret and terrifying agenda? If you wonder if the Hells Angels have the ability to infiltrate our government, stop worrying, because they have. There are those who believe in the existence of a book. A book that contains the most highly guarded secrets of the United States of America. A book whose very existence is known to only a select few. But if such a book exists, what would it contain? Secret histories? Secret memberships? Secret crimes? Does there really exist? America's Book of Secrets. Government officials estimate that there are between 300 and 500 outlaw motorcycle gangs with approximately 20,000 full patch members and another 200,000 associates. But for six decades, no biker gang has been more feared than the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club. The Hells Angels are the biggest, most powerful motorcycle gang in the world. A lot of other bikers would like to be a Hells Angel, but they're not all gonna make the cut. So their only other option is, is to start another outlaw motorcycle gang. The problem with that being is, unless they are openly subservient to the Hells Angels, then they're gonna have issues with the Hells Angels. There are between 2,500 and 4,000 Hells Angels in the world right now. They're on every continent except Antarctica. To become a Hells Angel at the most basic level, you have to be white, Latino, or Asian. A man, at least 21 years old, and you have to have an American-made motorcycle with an engine displacement of at least 1,000 cc's. While the Hells Angels keep their membership list a closely guarded secret, what is known is that most club members have an inherent distrust of authority figures and, of course, a passion for riding motorcycles. There's nothing like getting on that bike and going down the road and doing whatever you want to do. All those things about freedom and this and that, they're not cliches, they're true. It's hard not to hoot and whoop when you get on a Harley. The open road, it's freedom, it's America, it's being in nature and on a machine at the same time. Over the years, however, the Hells Angels has established a fearsome reputation for being loyal, tough, and extremely short-tempered. Among the rules that all motorcycle outlaws have to obey is to not suffer insults and to never let a club brother fight alone. I can't tell you how many times I've seen them beat up innocent uh, bystanders in bars for giving them a dirty look. Sturgis, South Dakota. Hundreds of thousands of bikers and their bikini-clad old ladies converge on the city for a week of riding, racing, and revelry. 
The Sturgis Motorcycle Rally is the biggest and best motorcycle rally in the United States and arguably in the world. Sturgis is an absolute crazy week of debauchery and sex and bikes and bad behavior. At Sturgis, there's probably not a lot of G or PG rated stuff going on there. There's the R rated, there's the X rated. Anything can be had there. August 10th, 2011. Amid this carnival-like atmosphere, several members of the Mongols, a notorious motorcycle gang based in Southern California, hold court at a restaurant called One-Eyed Jack's. The Mongols were kind of cranked up. They looked like they'd been drinking for quite a while. Very loud, raucous. As the sun sets, the Mongols walk towards a nearby bike shop, owned and operated by their longtime rivals, the Hells Angels. The Mongols were Hispanic bikers that were not allowed to join the Hells Angels. So they decided to say F you to the Hells Angels and start their own clubs. Some Mongols made the approach to the business. It appeared that they were there at least making their presence known, but not in a aggressive manner. Jeff Schwartz is standing on a nearby balcony, unaware of the events unfolding below him. All of a sudden I heard like a popping noise, pop, pop, pop. And I look down and there's 20, 25 guys going at it. The fighting lasts only seconds. But the attack leaves two bikers bleeding on the ground. A dozen others suffer superficial stab wounds. The sudden outbreak of violence sends a wave of fear through the crowd. I always considered Sturgis to be a safe environment. I'll never forget watching it. It's, it's like ingrained into my memory. One of the things the public doesn't know, and they, they should know, Sturgis is a run that the Hells Angels considered theirs. And if a club that they are at war with shows up, there is a huge opportunity that something very, very bad will happen. But why did it happen? Was this a simple fight for respect? Or perhaps something more? According to insiders, the Hells Angels and Mongols have been fighting a war with each other since the mid-1970s. The, the core of the feud between the Mongols and the Angels was the Mongols were much more numerous than the Hells Angels in Southern California. And so as a result of that, they started wearing a bottom rocker that said California. Before that, they had had bottom rockers that said Montebello or East LA or wherever the chapter was from. The Hells Angels noticed that the Mongols were wearing a California bottom rocker and they took it as an insult. The Hells Angels would not let this insult go unpunished. In 1977, on a freeway near San Diego, they opened fire with machine guns on a pack of Mongols, killing two members of the rival biker gang. But just to make sure the message got through, at the funeral of one Mongol, the Angels set off a car bomb. And it didn't end there. Within the next month, there were three bombings against the Mongols. And the Mongols had never forgotten those three bombings. Once these wars start, they never stop. According to law enforcement officials, the Mongols and Hells Angels are members of a secret society of outlaw motorcycle gangs, known as One Percenters, that are waging a bloody turf war across America. They are 1% that don't conform. They don't follow the laws, they live life on their terms, and they don't worry about repercussions. 
An outlaw motorcycle gang can be comprised of a group of people who are going to engage in anything that can make them money. Drug trafficking, heroin, marijuana, and you'll also see assaults, murders, extortion. But are the Hell's Angels just another motorcycle gang with violent tendencies? Or might there be something more to fear? If there were an America's Book of Secrets, the big secret of the Hells Angels would be that they are the Mafia on wheels. The Hells Angels have members who hold down real jobs. They're stockbrokers, pilots. They have this persona that they give out to the public. And yet they have been known to do arms deals, murder for hire. They have beat down people that have tried to leave the club. They are extremely violent, they're very dedicated, and whereas the Mafia tends to try to hide who they are, the Hells Angels proclaim it on their backs. They want people to know who they are, and there's an intimidation factor that comes along with that. The Angels and their supporters insist that any crimes committed are the acts of individuals and that the club itself shouldn't be judged by a few bad seeds. But are the Hells Angels really victims of propaganda? Or are they domestic terrorists? How did the Hells Angels become America's most infamous outlaws? Coming up. The 2002 Laughlin River Run, that was something that was a powder keg waiting to explode. The ATF knew what was going on, the extent to which they agitated that incident is a mystery. In September 2008, the TV series Sons of Anarchy premiered and quickly became one of the most popular shows in America. For the first time, a program featured an inside look at an outlaw motorcycle club, caught up in the violent world of illegal drugs, guns, and contract killings. But 43 minutes, you've had all these gunfights and you're burying bodies and castrating a pedophile clown and bribing government officials. And it's like, man, it's a day in the life. Hollywood's fascination with motorcycle gangs is nothing new. In the 1950s and 60s, movies such as The Wild One and Easy Rider created a lasting image of the rebel biker. The Hells Angels are the only biker gang that has branded the idea of the rebel biker. So they have brilliantly, masterfully created a PR campaign that has enabled them to franchise their brand worldwide. You ask a school teacher, a housewife, uh, a businessman to describe the stereotype of a biker, they say a hell's angel. Our society looks at them as rebels without a cause. They look at them as a cowboy, a bandito, uh, an outlaw, but with a romantic view. I think women are drawn to danger and power. And the Hells Angels embody both of those beautifully. And I don't think it gets much more dangerous than uh, riding on the back of, of a Hells Angel. There's something sexual and sensual about that. Would you ride on the back of Jesse James' horse? I would. This image, however, has proven to be a double-edged sword for the Hells Angels, who have both prospered and been persecuted because of their outlaw reputation. But what is fact and what is fiction when it comes to the notoriously secret biker gang? The image of the outlaw biker can be traced back to July 4, 1947, when 4,000 motorcyclists from around the country converged on the sleepy town of Hollister, California. The media coverage painted a picture of a town taken over by packs of out-of-control motorcycle gangs. 
And when Life magazine published a photograph of a drunken club member surrounded by beer bottles, the image of the rebel biker was born. But did the picture tell the whole story? The secret truth in that was that the picture was 100% staged. There was a reporter from the San Francisco Chronicle there named Barney Peterson. And he saw this guy on the street, threw him on a motorcycle, gathered up bottles, broken bottles, beer bottles, beer cans and stuff, put it around him, and took several pictures. In the wake of the incident in Hollister, one biker who attended the event, Otto Friedley, formed a new motorcycle club in San Bernardino, California. He called it the Hell's Angels. There's a lot of myths about how they were created. That they were old war veterans coming back and not being able to find a place to, to belong. Some of that's true, but the Hells Angels themselves were working class, white males, disenfranchised. They were trying to capture the American dream in a place where they couldn't find where it was. The Hells Angels name itself comes from a World War II uh, bomber squadron. The Hells Angels adopted red and white as their colors and decorated their jackets, or cuts, with the club's name and chapter along with their logo, a winged skull wearing a helmet. They adopted a lot of the military styles, so they have a patch system that is modeled after the military medals. They have a rank and file system, very much like the military. They have a hierarchy within their own group that is very much like the military. The club quickly expanded. New chapters opened up across California, and by the 1960s, even overseas. The public, however, remained largely ignorant of the Hells Angels until 1964, when police in Monterey, California, charged four members of the Angels with raping two teenage girls. Local and state politicians demanded action, resulting in the first official law enforcement investigation into the club. Thomas Lynch was the Attorney General of the state of California in 1965, and he issued a Lynch report. It was uh, written pretty dramatically, like fiction in a way. The Lynch report portrayed the Hells Angels as a real menace in the state of California and got a lot of people stirred up. Although the rape charges were dropped, the New York Times, Time, and Newsweek picked up on the lurid accusations and turned the Hells Angels into a household name. But the image of the Hells Angels as dangerous and violent outlaws was truly cemented when the Rolling Stones hired them to provide security at a concert outside San Francisco in 1969. The Rolling Stones had no idea who they were really dealing with until they got on stage and they realized they've got Hell's Angels out here who are using drugs and someone's probably gonna get hurt. And sure enough, somebody did get hurt and was killed. Nobody loved uh, the Hell's Angels anymore. They were portrayed as bad hippies, like the Manson family. And that's sort of the reputation that's stuck with them ever since. But while their star faded in Hollywood, one member transformed the Hell's Angels into the world's largest and most powerful motorcycle club, Ralph Sonny Barger. I firmly believe that, but not for Sonny Barger, the Hell's Angels wouldn't be around today. I think he's that important in the historical sense of that organization. Sonny Barger became a Hells Angel at 19. He very quickly became the president of the Oakland Charter of the Angels. Under Sonny Barger's leadership, the Hells Angels dramatically expanded their numbers and power by absorbing smaller one-percenter clubs. 
When he became president in 1958, the club had approximately 200 members. A decade later, that number had grown to over a thousand. According to law enforcement officials, the Angels also expanded their criminal activities, running guns and dealing drugs, especially LSD and methamphetamine. While several club members were arrested and jailed, including Sonny Barger, the Hells Angels continue to grow stronger. With the Hells Angels, the way that they cover up a lot of the crimes that they commit is because people are too afraid to cooperate against them. The federal government proved unsuccessful at infiltrating the Hells Angels for years until one agent finally earned their trust by becoming an outlaw himself. Coming up. Did I make mistakes? Did I sometimes say or do the wrong thing? Absolutely, I did. It's a chess game, and you better outthink your opponent. Otherwise, you'll end up with a bullet in your head. Laughlin, Nevada, April 27, 2002. During the city's annual River Run motorcycle rally, the Hells Angels and Mongols arrived with more on their minds than partying. The 2002 Laughlin River Run, uh, that was something that was a powder keg waiting to explode. The Mongols were staying at one end of the Laughlin Strip at a hotel called Harris, and the Angels are staying at the other end of the Strip at a hotel called the Flamingo. But there was one charter of the Hells Angels. The Frisco Hells Angels had always stayed at Harris, and so Mongols, for various reasons, started harassing them. The Angels called for reinforcements. Minutes later, the casino floor was filled with 40 to 50 Hells Angels, facing off with nearly 115 Mongols. A Mongol walked up to a Hells Angel named Ray Ray Folks and said, we're gonna f you up. And Ray Ray Folks kicked him in the chest and that's how it started. Security camera footage shows several men exchanging gunfire, while others attack with knives. A number of innocent bystanders were caught in the crosshairs of the deadly brawl. When it was over, three men lay dead. Nearly a dozen more were sent to the hospital. A search of the casino turned up nine guns and 65 knives, as well as a number of hammers and other heavy tools scattered about the floor. The public can't grasp what's happening. In a lot of ways, it's only when you see the effects. We're desensitized to seeing car crashes or tragedies on the news or in the newspaper. But the destructive effects of violent crimes are very real. Was this another spontaneous turf battle? Or was it, as the angels contend, a planned attack by the Mongols to make a name for their club in Nevada? Some believe the truth is even more unsettling, that the fight was instigated by undercover officers working for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. The ATF knew what was going on. The extent to which the ATF agitated that incident is one of the ATF's many secrets. There were ATF agents who were watching the fight brew for more than an hour in the surveillance rooms at Harris. I have been told and I tend to believe that there were two confidential informants working for the ATF who were on the casino floor in Harris at the time the fight erupted. If agents working for the federal government caused or even allowed the Laughlin shootout to happen, is it possible they have taken other 
questionable actions in monitoring outlaw motorcycle gangs. During the 1980s and 90s, efforts by both national and local law enforcement agencies to recruit informants or infiltrate undercover officers into the Hells Angels proved impossible. The club's president, Sonny Barger, bragged that the Angels were impenetrable. The reason the Hells Angels have been so difficult to infiltrate is because of their excruciatingly long prospecting period. Sonny Barger has been known to say it can be as long as it takes. So it's been a deterrent to law enforcement because they don't have years and years to infiltrate this club. They're uniquely paranoid. They're uniquely skeptical. Everything you say, everything you do, the clothes you wear, how you talk, the motorcycle you ride, the car you drive, the people you associate with, where you live, and the appearance of where you live are all reviewed and examined for any clue to them that will tip them that you're not legit. The tables finally began to turn in the wake of the Laughlin shootout when the ATF initiated Operation Black Biscuit. Operation Black Biscuit was a very sophisticated uh, undercover operation carried out by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. The goal of that investigation was to take the Hells Angels out in Arizona, and I think as importantly, to get inside on the Hells Angels, especially right in Sonny Barger's backyard. ATF officials selected as their lead undercover agent, Jay Dobbins, a former college football star and 15-year veteran with the Bureau. Dobbins assumed the identity of Jay Bird, a member of the Solo Angels, hoping to be patched into the Hells Angels. I played myself off to be a violent person, a hitman, someone who had connections to weapons trafficking, someone who could move narcotics, someone who could handle business on a violent level on the club's behalf. In an effort to convince the Angels to patch him in as a full member, Dobbins hatched a plan to stage the fake murder of a rival gang member hiding out in Mexico. I convinced the Hells Angels that I had committed a murder on behalf of the gang by taking a living, breathing member of our task force, dressed him up in the colors of the Mongols, took him into the desert, and used a homicide detective to basically create a homicide scene for us with blood, with brain matter, with a victim laying in a shallow grave, with his hands and feet duct taped together. Two days later, Dobbins returned with crime scene photographs and the dead man's leather vest, or cut. I brought physical evidence back to the Hells Angels as an actual display that a murder had been done, something that they could see and that they could touch and that they could feel to make it real to them. Once in the club, Dobbins gained a rare insight into the Hells Angels' secret agenda. When someone says to me the Hells Angels are just a simple group of thugs, my response to them is, turn around and run away as fast as you can. That's the secret, that's the joke on us. The truth is, they are a nasty, violent, vicious, international crime syndicate that will stop at nothing to defend their club, to defend the name of their club, and defend the membership within the club. Jay Dobbins spent nearly two years undercover. But in the end, would Operation Black Biscuit pay off? Or would the Hells Angels emerge even more emboldened and more dangerous than before? Coming up. The Hells Angels were hunting us, following us, staking us out. If you wonder if the Hells Angels have the ability to infiltrate our government, stop worrying, because they have. On July 8, 2003, 
Operation Black Biscuit ended with indictments against 16 Hells Angels members and associates, including three chapter presidents on racketeering, gun, drug, and murder charges. But before the cases could be brought to trial, the defense lawyers argued that government informants had compromised themselves by using illegal drugs and participating in criminal activities. The feds were forced to drop all criminal charges. The reality of it is the infighting inside the government on how to present that case in the courtroom became so extreme and so heated that we killed our own case. A decade later, Dobbins remains disillusioned by the outcome of his undercover work. I would love to say that what I did put such a significant dent in the Hells Angels that they'd never be the same. The reality of it is, they've only gotten stronger. They've only gotten bigger. They've only become more empowered. Today, the Hells Angels view their struggles with the federal government as just part of doing business. But a much bigger concern for both the Hells Angels and the American public is the rapidly growing threat posed by other outlaw motorcycle gangs and the secret war being fought on the streets for control of the drug trade. Sparks, Nevada, September 23rd, 2011. Jethro Pettigrew, chapter president of the San Jose, California Hells Angels, is shot and killed on the floor of John Esquaga's Nugget Casino. Several members of the Vagos, a rival one through center club, are on the attack. Hours later, on the street, a Vago is shot and killed in a drive-by shooting. Members of the public are always in danger of being in the wrong place at the wrong time with an organization like an outlaw motorcycle gang. And most of the public is very unaware. As a society, we cannot allow gang-on-gang -gang violence to spill into areas where our families are at, where our kids are at. Although the Sparks incident passed without further bloodshed, outlaw motorcycle gangs remain mired in an unending war. The largest and most violent of these clubs are the so-called Big Four MCs. The outlaws, banditos, pagans, and of course, the Hells Angels. They're very territorial, not just physical territory where they live, but also the types of crimes that they're doing. They don't want to deal with other gangs, and so they do stick out their territory, and they send messages. And if it requires the killing of another gang member in another group, it's done in a way to send a message. When you join a gang like the Hells Angels, you join it to have power, and power in the streets. 90% of it would be to bully a normal citizen. They don't like society. They don't like our world. Charles Falco spent nearly three years infiltrating the Vagos, and then later spent another five years infiltrating the outlaws. Falco witnessed firsthand the extreme methods used by the Hells Angels to protect their turf. The Hells Angels were hunting us, following us, staking us out. They're very methodical in planning their retaliation. They may wait a year and they may place a bomb, they may firebomb, they sniper with high-powered rifles. That's not stuff normal gang members have to worry about. The general public needs to know that because they're murderers and menaces to society. Different biker gangs have different weapons they like. The pagans, they have a big wood cane that's kind of like a bat. The Hells Angels have the ball-peen hammer. And the ball-peen hammer is perfect because it's legal. So there's no way the police can tell you can't have it. It's not like a claw hammer where you can only really use one side to bash someone's head in. I can pull this out and bash someone's head in using either side. If the Hells Angels are at the center of this underground war, 
then why haven't law enforcement officials been able to stop them? My house was burned down to the ground in 2008. Murder contracts offered against me. Threats to kidnap and videotape the gang rape of my wife. When the threats came down on me, my own government and my own agency abandoned me. They told me the Hells Angels are too big, they're too powerful, and you're on your own. Ironically, the Angels often conduct counter surveillance on the police, looking for undercover officers or club informants. I have found photographs of myself, photographs of my unmarked police vehicle inside different motorcycle gang members' homes. The Angels also use their old ladies and other friends of the club to infiltrate law enforcement agencies. Some of them will be dispatchers, for example, at police agencies. So they are there to gather intelligence in the same purpose as you know, a government agent might use an informant. They might have someone who's in law enforcement that's a traitor. It's a whole string of people and connections that do stuff for them. So if you are concerned or wonder if the Hells Angels have infiltrated our government or have the ability to infiltrate our government, stop worrying, because they have. While the police continue to search for ways to break up the Angels' criminal empire, the club keeps growing, especially overseas. But just how powerful and dangerous are these new foreign chapters becoming? And can anything be done to control them? Coming up. Biker games are America's export. They do have directives, and what that directive is is to control the turf and to be the biggest, baddest outlaw motorcycle gang in the world. Half a century ago, the Hells Angels were a ragtag group of rebels dedicated only to bikes, booze, and babes. Today, the club is a global empire with more than 100 sanctioned chapters in 25 countries around the world. Biker gangs are America's export. Anywhere that you go, you're going to be able to walk into any chapter and find exactly the same thing. And they have franchised themselves so that they can control the drug trafficking. Their mission is to become the dominant gang. So they do that by absorbing other biker gangs so that they can become the big red and white. As the international money and power has grown, so too has the violence. In Canada, a turf war involving the Quebec chapter of the Hells Angels witnessed the use of not just military assault rifles, but bombs and rocket-propelled grenades. The fighting has left an estimated 160 people dead and countless more maimed or injured, including innocent bystanders. They're like the equivalent of the cartels in Mexico. The Hells Angels wear a tab on their vest, the ones that have earned it, that says filthy few. Now their explanation of the filthy few to the public is that it's the filthy few that remain at the parties after the party's done. The truth of it is, is that you get a filthy few tab for the Hells Angels if you've committed a murder on their behalf. The U.S. government declared the Hells Angels an organized criminal gang in 1981 and since 2012 has prohibited international club members from entering the country. But on August 16, 2012, the Hells Angels filed a lawsuit against the Department of Homeland Security to have that criminal label officially removed. How is it that this brotherhood of bikers, with a reputation for being freewheeling anarchists, have become so well organized they can take on the U.S. government in a court of law? 
The Hells Angels are so wealthy at this point that they can hire the best attorneys and they can really fight anything that you throw up against them. But as far as their work, they let you see what they want you to see. There are about 240 charters in the club and each charter is a force unto itself. And so there is no central fund. One of the things that I learned on the inside is that there's rules and regulations and protocols beyond anything I ever expected. Members are required to attend regular meetings and pay club dues. Even an ordinary activity, like riding around town, is regimented by what some call the code of the road. In most cases, when riding a pack, uh, Hells Angels, you usually have your president up front and right next to him would be your sergeant of arms because he's the bodyguard for the president of the chapter. And that way you keep the president up front and protected, just like you would the president of the United States. The Hells Angels are the business model for every other outlaw motorcycle gang to follow. They know what they're doing and they've obviously been very successful in their endeavors up to this point. People can look at and say, oh, you know, they're incorporated. They can't be a bad organization. But as they become more corporate, are the Hell's Angels moving away from their violent past? Or has it only helped them to wage a more effective public relations campaign? Their motto is, we do something nice, everyone forgets, and when we do something bad, they remember forever. There are gang members who marry, have children, have families. They provide for their families. Hells Angels want some of the same similar things that we want, but they're willing to engage in criminal activities to obtain them. Is it possible that the Hells Angels' most dangerous crime has been convincing the public that they are simply a band of rebel bikers out in search of the American dream? They have a, an image for the public, and then they have their private image. And so the public image is what they would like people to believe, that they are just motorcycle enthusiasts that have come together, and they um, fund charities, Toys for Tots, and the public image is really a foil for criminal exploits. They exist to commit crimes to protect each other, and yet for most of the public, it's hard to accept that something could be that bad. A lot of these guys don't fit the stereotype. You'd be standing next to one of these guys pumping gas, or at a grocery store, or at a movie theater, and you wouldn't know they're Hell's Angels. As a society, as civilians in communities where their Hell's Angels are present, have we seen the tip of the iceberg? Just the tippy tip of it, and it's massive beneath it. The Hell's Angels live by a creed of angels forever, forever angels. It's a lifelong bond and a brotherhood forged in chrome, leather, and blood. And until law enforcement agencies and the public take their threat more seriously, no doubt the angels will ride on through the 21st century. Bigger, bolder, and badder than...